Okay, um, so we start the, the last session that I'm going to give. And this session is going to focus on uh, the stakeholders, the different stakeholders for a just transition to a low carbon economy. And we're going to look at some, let's say, initial solutions and maybe um, a solution that each stakeholder should be thinking about in terms of trying to achieve a just transition. So if you remember, um, let's say a couple of days ago we were talking about the risks and this is just to remind you of some of those risks that we're trying to solve here we're trying to solve for each stakeholder is looking towards how we solve some of these risks. So when we're thinking of the risk allocation between the different stakeholders in society or the different stakeholders in the energy sector, what we should be asking is who do you think should take on more of the risk? Should it be the companies should it be the government? Should it be uh, citizens who, who often benefit from, uh, let's say, the services of the company, the control of the government? So, if I was to ask all of you, who thinks, you know, between those three stakeholders, who thinks it is the government who should take on the biggest risk. When, when we think of maybe one project or one sector, it could be the energy sector, it could be manufacturing, but generally, who should take on the biggest risk? You, so who would put your hands up if you think it should be the government? So maybe seven or eight. Who thinks it should be the companies? maybe uh, 12, 13, and who thinks it should be the citizens? So, uh, no one. So, you know, generally, you would generally be cor correct if, if we were to take a view, uh, well, in, let's say in this class, no one said it would be the citizens or civil society, but you can see generally from international uh, let's say international surveys, generally people would say the companies have to take on the majority of the risks. So you see 51%, government should take on 33% of the risk, uh, and roughly civil society 16%, so a small amount. And I suppose some people would argue citizens do need to take on some risk, and they would say in part that's that citizens do need to take on some responsibility, let's say for education, educating themselves on some of the risks, educating each other on some of the risks, um, and that's why, you know, maybe 16, 33% uh, for the government. Um, this is maybe more where you're dealing with the new technology that the government should be taking more of a role, they should be influencing companies and society to take on this new technology. I would probably say that the companies need to take on more of the risk because the companies are getting more of, let's say, of the reward. So um, that would just be my own view, but I think um, a lot of people will be thinking for energy technologies which we're very familiar with, companies should take more of the risk. If it's maybe a very new technology, we need the government to take on some of the risk so that we can get this new technology started. So, when we're thinking of some solutions about what can we do working together and how can we move beyond, let's say, um, different stakeholders continuing 
to, let's say, debate among themselves and then action doesn't happen. So maybe uh, similar to today in Colombia where there's uh, renewable energy projects are slow to develop because the stakeholders have not yet made a full agreement. And one of the key solutions that we see around the world is the apportioning of benefits. So it goes back to, um, and you can see I just put there at the next to solutions, it concerns distributive justice, procedural justice, recognition justice. And the idea here is you're sharing the benefits of a project. It cannot be that the benefits all come to the company. And there are several solutions of, the, or several ways you can share benefits. It can be that you share benefits in terms of the population, a certain population live there. It can be an indigenous community. It can be a small, you know, small town, a small village or several small villages, and you share it according to population size or population density. It can also be shared with, uh, in terms of the land mass, in terms of estimating uh, how much land is going to be used for the project. It can be shared in terms of the potential for environmental loss. So what is the potential environmental loss? Your access to the environment, if that is restricted, what, is, what does that mean for your community? And you share that, uh, you know, the benefits are shared so that people are compensated for that loss uh, to their way of life. Alternatively, you can share with, in terms of a project comparison. You maybe look at another project in another sector in the economy or in the country. You may even look internationally, what happened in a neighboring country, how did they do it? How did they share the benefits? And today, we should really be thinking about sharing the benefits. We only need to look at some of the profit margins of big international companies. There should be, uh, some of the benefits of projects should be going back uh, to the community or, in essence, to the country. The second way is around education. And this is a very, um, let's say, big decision that has to happen across the world, whether it's a developed country or a developing country. Research uh, in, in some of the leading research journals shows that generally there are still more people being educated on how to develop and, well, how to extract and develop coal, oil and gas, both in terms of science and non-sciences. Um, than there is people being trained how to develop, you know, how to develop clean technology. So, in many ways, sometimes you can't criticise what is happening in the world today because you'd be saying, well, actually, if we're training more people to be educated to develop fossil fuels, there is a reason why we are devel still developing more fossil fuels. You know, people leave the university having only been educated in exploit the exploitation of fossil fuels. They therefore leave the university expecting a job to develop fossil fuels. And one of the ways when we think of education is to develop more collective education tools to understand clean energy, climate, the benefit to climate change, the cost of clean energy, and how they compare with fossil fuels. Currently, the way things, the way people receive an education can be very, very different. So when you learn even about clean energy in uh, the United States of America, in some universities, can be very different how you learn it, let's say, in an Asian university, to an African university, to a Latin American university. And then, that affects decision making in a country because what you have is many voices, even though we're all talking about the same thing. I mean, no matter where you are in the world, energy technology works exactly the same way. There's a science behind energy technology. It should not be disputed, but yet we see a lot of 
let's say, uh, fake news around energy, and that is the problem. People are not receiving uh, sufficiently the same education, so it allows for too many voices that are disputing certain issues, and therefore we're not choosing the best technology, which is the clean technology. So you can ask yourself for a similar comparison. When we talk about, uh, when people talked about the COVID-19 vaccine, people said um, there are certain vaccines which are better, but no one disputed the fact you had to take a vaccine. But when we talk about energy, we should be saying we know clean energy is better, clean energy technology is better. But unfortunately in today's world, we still have people saying we want oil, gas and coal. So imagine, uh, you know, we, we, let's say we had a small number of people who didn't want to take the COVID vaccine, uh, but they were saved, as it were, by the majority, the vast majority of people who did take a vaccine. Um, and, you know, the statistics prove that the people, more people died who didn't take the vaccine than did who did, you know, who took the vaccine. But again, you look at, um, you know, all different types of technology. We move uh, towards uh, the newer technologies, which are better uh, generally. So in a similar way, we need these collective education tools. And, and just to give you an example, when we specifically look at energy projects, and you look at companies interacting with local populations. You might have three or four companies trying to build a project. And they all come in with their own version of why their project should be accepted. When they should actually just be working together. They're all selling the same wind energy technology. You don't need to be sending four messages to the same bunch of communities. They're hearing four different reasons of why it should be built, what it involves, and it's only natural, therefore, they get confused and they begin objecting to, to, uh, these new, to the same new technology. So that's what I mean by it should be, we should have more of a collective education. And again, when we think of maybe certain ministries, you have a ministry for you know, finance or economics, the Ministry for Climate Change, Ministry for Energy, Ministry for Environment. Again, they're all sending different messages about which is better to build, which is a better option, which brings in more revenue. So this is, again, something we need more collective education between the stakeholders. The third solution is about increasing representation and this fits in with procedural justice, distributive justice, and again, recognition justice. And here we're thinking of these four uh, reasons. We're thinking of ensuring representation at each phase of the project development. So, and, and we want that representation recorded and decisions made. What you want to be able to say is um, that when we started this project, there were maybe 100 different communities we had to deal with. After a couple of years, there were 200 communities we realized we had to deal with. But what you want is a record of when you first started interacting with the local communities. And also, the local communities should be having a record when they were first contacted by companies, by the government. Because often what you see in society is uh, five or six years into the project, we're objecting to the project because this was never discussed. And neither the local community, nor the government, nor the company have a record if that issue was discussed four years ago. The local community, you could argue, maybe it should not be their responsibility to keep the records, but the company may not be keeping the records on purpose. They don't want to highlight maybe certain issues they should have or should not have disclosed. Um, but again, we should be thinking 
what is the representation at each stage. And if you remember the project life cycle I had, local communities or regional groups are particularly interested in will this company disappear after they make all their money? What's going to happen when the company make all their money? What will we be left with? Will there be an exodus of workers? The schools will be half full. The, you know, we will lose half the teachers in the schools. The hospitals will be half full. We lose half the medical services that have been built up over time. Will all, you know, half the shops, restaurants disappear, etc., etc. So all these issues of you know, your society will disappear. So again, having that representation for the full duration of uh, what is happening. The second issue, let's say, is around having independent panels or committees for representation. So one thing we see when we're trying to move towards a low carbon economy in different sectors is particularly the energy. You have a different committee established, a regional committee, to try and accelerate change or to try and achieve change or try and provide some uh, type of legitimate um, account of that change. But unfortunately, usually these panels are not independent. So there's no confidence often by some of the stakeholders, whether that be the local community, even if that is, whether that be by the companies or even the government may have no confidence because of who is on these uh, committees. Um, and in, sometimes in many countries it's the same people who are transferred from old committees to new committees. So you, you imagine you have experts in oil and gas suddenly being experts in clean energy and how things should change. And the view would be they never changed anything to improve uh, representation of, of citizens when they were in the oil and gas industry, why would they now be changing things when they're suddenly in uh, representing uh, you know, the clean energy sector? So a fourth action is, again, revolves around this word collective action. And this corresponds to cosmopolitan justice, restorative justice, and recognition justice. And here, we're thinking that, again, companies too often are focused on, on working alone, when they should be working together and working together with government and with local communities. And again, it's about creating a one voice and building confidence. And the idea being that they create together, if they work together, there's more resources there um, and they'd be able to create better solutions, there's more transparency because the companies have to work together and disclose information to each other to agree a pathway forward. And this uh, increases the accountability uh, for all uh, stakeholders. So, in terms of specifically, you know, there are some solutions that we can think of as we go into talk about specifically managing stakeholders and what's known as uh, the three ORs. And when we think of the three ORs, which are risk, uh, reward, and responsibility, but the key one is responsibility. We have these. 17 Sustainable Development Goals created in 2015 and that agenda is for 2030. Companies today have to show how the, all their practices are aligned with these 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is their responsibility to show this. And we can look at some of these in particular and I'll just put this uh, quote up from the Secretary General of the UN who stated that, you know, this year that currently we live in a moment of justice. That is the key focus for him, essentially, of the UN today is to increase justice. So, you know, again, that, going back to that idea of a just transition. 
And if we're looking in particular at different UN Sustainable Development Goals, you can look uh, specifically at these ones. Preserving culture, number 11. Protecting and enhancing gender inequality, number 5. Climate action, 13. Protect the clean energy sector. So, a fourth action is, again, revolves around this word, collective action. And this corresponds to cosmopolitan justice, restorative justice, and recognition justice. And here, we're thinking that, again, companies too often are focused on, on working alone, when they should be working together and working together with government and with local communities. And again, it's about creating a one voice and building confidence. And the idea being that they create together, if they work together, there's more resources there um, and they'd be able to create better solutions. There's more transparency because the companies have to work together and disclose information to each other to agree a pathway forward. And this uh, increases the accountability uh, for all uh, stakeholders. So, in terms of specifically, you know, there are some solutions that we can think of as we go into talk about specifically managing stakeholders and what's the company earning what economists refer to as super normal profits. I begin to think that there is something wrong. Are our citizens, are the government receiving sufficient money from that particular energy activity? And that's what you want to be asking is, if you see a situation and someone says, you know, is this sector in our economy, is this just? You want to be saying, well, look at the reward. I see this company is only paying 2% tax. Why are they only paying 2% tax? Why are they getting more of the reward? And then you would be asking yourself, are they taking on the majority of the risk? And often you will find, uh, environmentally, they are not taking on the majority of the risk. You may look, um, and so, you know, you may look deeper and say, you know, in fact, it is the government or the taxpayer taking on the majority of the risk. I gave the example in the UK where the UK taxpayer is estimated to pay 100 billion for cleaning up after oil and gas. So I mean, that is the risk being transferred to the public citizen, to the taxpayer, while the company's got uh, the majority of the reward. So you need to be thinking, where is that reward going? Who is benefiting the most? And in, in today's world, we are looking more and more at this issue of reward. Are we getting enough uh, back into society? Is the government getting enough? Are the citizens who live near these uh, types of infrastructure, are they receiving enough benefits? Again, it goes back to that question of reward. And the third issue is around responsibility. Who should be taking responsibility? And this is a key question, um, again, whether, you know, it doesn't really matter whether it's a developed country or a developing country, but again, it comes back to this question. Usually, these multinational companies, they have the knowledge. They know, they know how things are going to happen. Does anyone know, uh, let's say, for the last 30 or 40 years, can you name maybe two of the biggest energy companies in the world. One from, one from America, one from uh, the Netherlands. Who's, who's the company from the Netherlands? Shell. Shell. What's the biggest energy company from the US? Dixac. Say, say it again. Dixac. Uh, it's uh, Exxon, Exxon ah, Mobil. Um, and Exxon Mobil was very influential, so influential that a 
I think it was Trump appointed the CEO of ExxonMobil in as a, I think he was Secretary of Energy for a year or two before he before he was fired. <laughs> but, um, both ExxonMobil and Shell have been proven. I think ExxonMobil since the 1970s, Shell since the 1980s. We now have the documentation from their board meetings where they knew about the issue of climate change. They knew that they were uh, damaging the environment. So these companies have had the knowledge for years of the damage that they were doing. So when we think about the third or responsibility, we have to be asking what, how responsible should companies be? And many of you may know uh, the term uh, CSR um, in, in English, corporate social responsibility. That has been around for maybe 20, 30 years. I would argue has it been successful. If, well, if you look at their actions still, it probably hasn't. But again, how responsible should companies be? And then there's another question. If you think companies are not responsible, does that mean the governments have not been responsible for managing the companies? They haven't set down the proper law or policy for these companies. And let's say maybe the challenge today is lots of these companies operate internationally. So it's very hard to control them because unfortunately you know, governments internationally don't often agree about how to control these, these companies. So it's very easy for an energy company to avoid paying tax in one country and you know, they may have to pay higher tax in another country. So just, you know, just to give you an example, I think uh, on the first day someone mentioned the issue of um, my child miners still working and still dying in mines in Africa. In particular, we see around 50 or 60,000 child miners in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and they are working in mines that produce cobalt, which um, I believe is used in some the batteries and in some laptops, uh, as well as mobile phones. Uh, representing, um, you know, the or in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you have 50,000 uh, child miners, but for cobalt, the Democratic Republic of Congo has nearly 50% of the world's supply. And when they were extracting it, they were advised by an international, by an international organization. Uh, essentially, they were advised by an international organization. I'm aware that I'm uh, being recorded, so I should uh, adjust my wording. But they were essentially advised by the World Bank to nearly have a tax rate of 4% for the extraction of cobalt. Imagine 4%. Because what they were told was, if you had it at 20%, no one would want to ex come in and, and extract cobalt. And if you were studying the industry, you'd be going, well, the world needs more cobalt because we're producing batteries more and more for, for cars, computers, phones, for all sorts of technology. Of course, there's going to be a huge demand for cobalt. But they were told, go with the lower, essentially the lower tax rate. Uh, after lots of adjustments, the tax rate would work, work, would work out at somewhere between two to four percent. Um, on paper, the tax rate was more, but the actual tax rate would work out at two to four percent. If you look at a developed world country, uh, let's say Norway, for a different type of resource that they extract, oil or gas, they charge 70 to 80 percent. So I'm not saying that cobalt in the Democratic Republic of Congo, should, they should be charging 80 percent. But I mean, there's, there's a huge difference between, you know, let's say 3 percent to 70 to 80 percent. Surely 
the Democratic Republic of Congo should have been allowed charge a higher tax rate. And if, if anything, that would have meant the extraction of cobalt would have happened in a more sustainable fashion because companies still would have gone in, they would have paid the 20%, but they may not have extracted as much. Whereas what we see is the lower tax rates you have, the companies will go in and extract as fast as they can. And soon there will be nothing left. So when you think of that issue of responsibility, you could hardly blame the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo for being irresponsible because they were advised by an international organization, this is what you should set your tax rate as. And in many countries, we see the same thing. We see companies being too influential in helping countries set a tax rate. Even uh, an example from my own, my own country where we, we don't have much energy resources, but we had a gas field and they were advised mainly by international companies to set a seven year tax break for the gas company for extracting the gas. Everything was gone in five years. So can you blame the government uh, for being responsible? They are getting advice from the international community and then um, they are applying that advice but um, you know, it is not, let's say, the correct advice. So we need to think who is more responsible. And equ equally, we can think even of responsibility from the local community perspective. When a local community has to deal with the government or a company, who, who are the leaders going to make those agreements? Who are going to enter those negotiations? What level of responsibility do they have? Have they received sufficient, are they, you know, are they educated on the particular issues? And these are questions we have to ask. So when we're thinking of any, let's say, energy activity or any activity to achieve a just transition, you always want to be thinking of risk reward responsibility. How does that balance out? And are the stakeholders trying to achieve a balance between these three activities. And if you go to one of the stakeholders, you will often find that's where they disagree. They say the government should have more responsibility, um, you know, and they th the company thinks they should have more of the rewards, and this is why things uh, do not happen. So, um, in, in many countries in the world, for example, there's a technology, carbon capture and storage, which they say um, will deal with some of the emissions from oil and gas. It will only deal with a percentage. But in many countries, carbon capture and storage has not happened because of the risk issue. The companies don't want to take on all the risk and the government don't want to take on all the risk. So there's, they're, they're not able to reach an agreement. It's a new technology that neither fully want to take on the risk and therefore uh, we have made limited advances. So um, when we think about stakeholder management, this is the key question uh, that we should be asking. And if you solve this, if you get the three stakeholders to agree on the level of risk, the level of reward, the level of responsibility, then you will actually have an agreement and you can go forward and the activity and the project uh, can happen. So the idea there is essentially we are trying to in reduce risk through increasing justice across these four stages, as I mentioned, of the project life cycle. You can see them again there in that diagram, planning to construction to operation through to decommissioning. And one example of this is the energy, what's called the energy finance reserve obligation. I've mentioned it very briefly before. But this is one, one mechanism, let's say another solution, where 
if you're trying to show that you, let's say you're trying, a company is trying to show it wants to be more responsible, one very easy solution is to uh, put money into a fund that can pay for any, let's say, decommissioning or waste management issues. And that shows the local community and also shows the government that the company is committed to a long-term relationship. And if I, let's say if I was a policymaker today, that would be one of the first questions I would ask the company. Are you willing to pay into a fund? If they said no, I would say, okay, goodbye, let's get the next company in. And this is proven in, us, in Australia where they tried to make coal companies have a fund to pay for the cleanup. And I think nearly overnight, no one wanted to buy coal assets in Australia. Because no one wanted to pay in, you know, if they bought the asset, they had to put up all this money to pay into, uh, let's say, this type of uh, finance fund. So that should be the way, a very easy way to test, is this company serious about having a long-term commitment uh, to the local community and also long-term commitment of a good relationship with the local government and the national government. So when we're thinking about this and when we see uh, companies thinking about this, we see them beginning to utilize a type of scenario planning and uh, scenario planning approach and what they show and what they try and present information on it's essentially a, corp a strategic thinking tool helps them uh, think a bit like um, the just transition pathway diagram that I had on before that policymakers may use but for companies they may be thinking about this in thinking about all these scenarios and they have the different risks that they see as big risks they would think about resilience, so what happens if you have an economic crisis, what happens if you have something like COVID-19 and you have to be able to manage for these different issues. Then what happens if you have climate change? And let's say uh, one, of, one of the, uh, in terms of, let's say, uh, hearing from what a couple of companies recently um, not uh, over in Europe, they were saying, we, we didn't realize when we tried to build this energy project, we didn't realize that the local citizens would be um, very against the project and they would be um, very opposed to this project being built. And what I would be saying is, well, you're a company. We know that you have a strategic planning unit in your company. We know that you are conducting scenario analysis. We know that you are looking at resilience issues if there's certain shocks. So as a company, you should have foreseen that the local community would not be in favor of your project. But what the company is really saying is, we want to build the project as cheaply as possible. So we hoped we could, we could go in and you know, not have to deal with, the, deal with the local community as fast as possible, as aggressively as possible, and move forward with the project. You know, so we, we should have an expectation of what these companies, uh, the information that they have, and the information that they are utilizing. And again, you know, you can see from the policy perspective, just a reminder uh, of that goal. And let's say, that is why, to go back to that word that I mentioned before, that's why the, the UN specifically is talking about this idea of future proofing. They're trying to make uh, citizens, they're trying to make governments aware companies should be able to foresee all the different problems today. We should not be allowing the companies avoid the responsibility that they should have they have this information and they should be factoring this information in to their decision making. So 
as part of this, what we want to uh, see happening or what we want to achieve is normally if you conduct, um, let's say, from time to time a government or a company or usually part of a company, they will, uh, they will have an environmental impact assessment report where they look at the environmental issues and they conduct what's known as a baseline uh, test, but this is the baseline um, of all these environmental issues. This is, what, this is what's happening, let's say, in 2023. And in a similar way, what we, we are looking or what uh, is, is happening to some degree and what is enabling projects to happen is by reporting in a similar way how is justice, uh, how do companies, governments start to develop activities with these different types of justice in their project or in their activity. So I gave the example of the US where they, before you apply for the money or before you apply for the project, you have to show it. But equally, um, you know, in countries all across the world, they should be building this evidence to say in 2023, this is the way, th this is how things are happening. You know, this is how the socioeconomic condition of this region is. This is the funding that they were getting off companies before or off the government. And then you are saying, what are the changes? So the idea is to show uh, how are things changing, where are things changing, and then the timeline. When did it start? And this means that there's a lot more transparency in what is happening. So a local community can say to the company, actually, in 2023, you did not transfer 5 million to this regional fund to help our hospitals, to help uh, restore uh, the damage from the environmental problems that you created. You actually only transferred 1 million. In the past, the energy company would be saying, we, we gave you 5 million. We have some record somewhere of giving you 5 million but no one would ever have a um, independent or consistent record of the information. So what these are referred to are, let's say, milestone reports. And these are, these are not just um, applied in the energy sector, they can be applied, let's say, in, sometimes in the health sector, sometimes in other infrastructure projects you have these milestones when you, you get to a certain point, you essentially have an audit, you have, let's say, a period of reflection to say, how have things been achieved? And you can see the explanation there. Um, it's a documented relationship of the strategy with the local community and, and also with the government. And it provides a periodic baseline of progress in the different activities. And the idea is, you're having a report on what did they do for procedural justice, distributive, restorative, and then recognition and cosmopolitan. So you're, you have four reports being produced to show how you try to improve justice in, um, for this activity you know, in terms of the economy overall. So, um, you know, in a, let's say, more complete diagram, that's essentially what you have going in. You have the justices going into the four reports, and then uh, those four reports are saying, here's how we try to achieve these justices and improve societal outcomes, the just outcomes in society. And that's how we built the risk-reward that relationship of risk reward and responsibility how did that change so in you, what you'd be saying is if you started something in 2023 this was the current relationship of risk reward and responsibility between the three stakeholders and then you're saying let's say you agree that in 2025 you have a 
energy justice milestone report and you then say how has that relationship changed what are all the actions you've done in terms of the trying to improve just outcomes and how have you changed that relationship of risk reward and responsibility and what you'd identify after five years if you said actually in terms of reward the local community or the government is not receiving enough money. The companies are still receiving 80%. Then you have to go back to the distributive justice and say, we need more action on distributive justice to change that relationship. But the idea is the relationship is far more transparent and it's, it's like a working relationship where you're easily able to identify let's say after a period of time, three years, five years, what is not working in that relationship and therefore you can change um, the issue that is not working, whether it be distributive, restorative recognition. And that is the idea so that over a journey, if you remember, we talk about this just, trans just transition journey, over a journey that you're not leaving any, anyone behind so that you can say our relationship of risk reward and responsibility has changed from 2023 we're now in 2035 and we can show that we have brought more people along this journey um, let's say than, than might have happened let's say in the past so um, I, think I think we can finish there for some questions and since it's my final class, you know, do stay in touch, anyone who I think I sh shared one of the books before, uh, but you can freely circulate that book. Uh, but anyone who does want um, either of the books there, just feel free to send me an email and I'll share them with you. Um, or if you're interested in research from our group, I will add uh, your email to the email list for the energy justice and social contract uh, let's say research group so thank you very much thank you professor